But for the rest of today, what we want, I wanted to do was kind of describe how you would combine actual spin state. So here, so if you're trying to describe mixture of spin up state and spin down state, you simply get another spin half that's pointing in a different direction. Okay, so let's give that up. Let's say instead of do this, let's try to, um, where's my other ball? Uh, let's try to say, okay, I have one spin half particle. And instead of trying to put this into spin zero state, which is not possible, we kind of knew that, right? Because when you look at the quantum numbers, there's only plus h over 2 and minus h over 2. There's no 0. So, so instead of trying to put this into spin 0 state, we are going to say, all right, I am going to add another spin up system. And maybe by adding them together, I can make their total spin 0. Yeah. yeah. So um, OK, I didn't quite plan this right. I need to erase the board. It'll take me like five minutes. Once I'm done erasing, then we'll start with the description of that um, addition of spins. We are moving to this. Addition of two spin half states. Yeah, so take a five minute break or something. I'm gonna erase the board and um, yeah, ready in like five minutes. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so this is where I need to lecture a little bit to at least to give you some intuitive feel for the mathematical operation we are going to do. Um, um, it leads to in, into something called the product space. How many here have heard of product space? So, direct product space. So, um, so I mean that's a upper division level math. Actually, you've seen product space, the Cartesian three dimensional space. That's a product space of you know one dimension, second dimension, third dimension. That's how you deal with the orthogonal spaces that don't affect each other. Um, but you know, you wouldn't say there's like a cold product space until you get to upper division mathematics. So uh, I don't have any material written for that because um, this note that I wrote up was for high school students. <laughs> so um, that's why I need to lecture on this a little bit to give you some sense of intuition and how to handle when you are adding two particles where they are not supposed to affect each other. So this is what I mean that they are not supposed to affect each other. So, um, well, take this as an example. Uh, if I took this as a system, and let's say I made a measurement of the um, the z, I made a measurement of the z uh, projection of the first particle. I could say, all right, uh, act on this with the z component for the first particle. So the way I drew it. It's a spin up. So I would uh, expect to get plus h bar over 2 from this spin up. And this state would be left undisturbed, right? That's what you saw when you are doing calculation. Right? What do you think should happen to the state number 2? How many say nothing? Yeah, nothing. I'm measuring particle one. For all I know, they could be miles apart. So the operation I'm doing to particle one, it ideally shouldn't affect the particle two. So, all right. So particle two should be left undisturbed. So this is the state you should have with. Um, so that's the operation you are to be able to. Now, um, Imagine you are, instead of measuring g component of particle 1, you are measuring the, um, I don't know, you are measuring the x component of particle 2. Should anything happen to particle 1? Nothing. So the state of particle 1 should remain as it is. Does it look like something out to happen to particle? Like, would I remain with the same state at the end? Yeah, this is not in an x uh, uh, component eigenstate, right? It's some mixture of whatever. So the particle two, in general, it would be something else, like some other state too. And in fact, since it's not an eigenstate, we are not going to have this nice thing. It's going to be some number that whatever it is. So, so. That's the paradigm that I'm trying to describe, that whatever, but I guess what remains true 
is that the state one didn't change at all. So if you took this, and, and then if you measured um, the x com uh, g component of particle one now, then you would get what you are supposed to get. You know, this thing times h bar over two. That's what you would get. Because whatever you did with the particle two, it did not affect particle one. So that's the mathematical kind of operation that we are, um, um, th that's, the, that's the underlying picture that we are now trying to describe with our math. So, direct, uh, so this is described with a, a formal, um, formal structure called the direct product space. The way you would uh, kind of indicate it is like, so state of particle one, uh, product, so let's say times, but I want to make sure it's not any kind of product that you know. So let's say circle. <laughs> and this is not associated with anything else in your mind. So I'm just going to write that. Uh, times the particle state two. And kind of basic rule is that when, you, so this is the uh, state, this is the state that describes the entire system. The system with the particles one and particle two. And you can do a bunch of different operations here. You can do any of these component operations, x1 or uh, x, y, z on particle one or x, y, z on particle two. Or you can do this, um, the s squared thing that we derived before. You can do s squared for particle one. You can do s squared for particle two. Yep. Now, let's think about trying to build a zero angular momentum state. Like, it ought to be possible, right? So. It ought to be possible to somehow combine. Uh, so this is spin up. This this is particle one. This is particle two. It ought to be able to somehow combine this spin up and uh, well, particle one with a spin up, for example, with a particle two in a particular state, so that they add up to zero, maybe spin down. Then like this combined state ought to represent a spin zero state. Yes. Okay, so let's try that. So um, then I guess by my where I'm place I'm leading, I'm saying, okay, so for zero spin, let's try this. For zero spin, well, I have this spin. Um, uh, let me use this, uh, uh, symbols because uh, I'm actually going to use slightly different matrices than these. So let me stick with the symbols. So for particle one, I use a spin up state. So spin up particle one in direct product to it, spin down particle two. All right, so if uh, this is what we think is a zero spin state, how would you measure for a fact that it has zero spin? What kind of mathematical operation would you do to prove that this particle state has zero spin? S squared, S squared operator. Hmm. All right, let me try that. So if I apply S squared operator to, uh, let me keep color coding, psi um, spin up one, x, psi, spin down two. Well, let me, um, let me do it in a way that, could, that is going to be a mistake, but it's a common mistake to make. It's a mistake I made when I was an undergrad, when I was unfamiliar with the notations. The easy mistake to make is, oh, s squared. Well, this is an eigenstate of that. So I get h bar squared, three over four, and the same state back. Oops, something went wrong. I wasn't supposed to get um, this, right? What did I do wrong? It's not a high density. No, it's a, a little bit more complicated than that. So this S squared, is a, it's a ill-defined. Um, did I mean S1 squared? Did I mean S2 squared? 
Um, either way, if I, whether it was S1 squared or S2 squared, this is actually correct. And um, of course that's correct because your particles still remain, retain their distinct identity. If you're measuring the angular momentum uh, magnitude of a spin particle one, then of course that you should measure that. Like that's not a wrong result. It's just not what you thought you were calculating, <laughs> right? So let me spell this out a little bit more carefully. Let me start by defining a new variable so that we are not making this rookie naive mistakes. Let me define a um, total angular momentum operator. I'm gonna call it J, it's a common symbol. J, total angular momentum operator. And I'm gonna put vector symbol on it because angular momentum is a vector. Well, from classical physics, what do you think of this out to be equal to? Uh, we are not doing orbital angular momentum. We are just keep. This is a vector operator, which is supposed to be the total sum of two other vectors. Just add that, yeah, just add that. right? <laughs> it's the sum of s1 plus s2. That's what it's supposed to be. So I'm keeping it that way. Yeah? Um, and all right. Now I don't really want to deal with the vector operators. I do want j squared. And what j squared is, is well, it's a j dotted to itself. Or let me expand it out with this. It's uh, s1 plus s2 dotted to s1 plus s2. So when I'm just writing down the algebra, it doesn't look like I'm doing anything different from what you are used to doing. But though this, is, this is the reason we spend so much time on doing the other one in more detail. Because what these are, are they are operators, and there's a, the, each symbol represents a more complex mathematical object than what you're used to dealing with so far. So, but let me go through it. The outside look is actually still remains simple. S1 dotted to S1 itself, well, that's, I guess, going to be S1 squared, right? And uh, uh, S1 dotted to S2. All right, I don't know what that is, so let me just write it out. Plus S1 vector dotted to S2. We'll just leave it there for now. Um, S2 dotted to S1. I also don't know what that means, so let me just write it out. S2 dotted to S1. And S2 dotted to S2. So you get plus S2 squared. All right, at least the two of those things I know what to do with. This I know what to do with, this I know what to do with. And these, um, well, I guess if I expand it out, it's gonna be S1x times S2x plus S1y plus times S2. It, it is possible to work through this. So let me just try to work through this. And um, I can show you that this state, it, it's an eigenstate of the G operator. That's what this was. But it is not an eigenstate of the total angular momentum magnitude operator. So, um, oh, so this, yeah, that's what happens when you're improvising. So we just need to work this out. So S1 squared, I think I know, I understand this operator well. So I can leave that alone, this operator. I understand it well enough, so I can leave that alone. Um, the operator that I need to deal with are these. Um, so let me just uh, write it out. S1 squared plus S2 squared plus, and I'm just gonna write these two out. It's gonna be S1x, S2x, um, plus S1, oh, y, S2y plus S1g, S2g, um, that plus um, the order swapped, S2x times S1x plus S2y times S1y plus S2g times S1g. Um, here's a question. So, so far I've been treating these two as if they don't commute because I want it to be careful. 
do they actually commute? In the sense of if you measured x component of set particle two first, and then the particle one, or if you swap the order, would that matter? No, right? Because they are they don't in, like this doesn't affect any particle one state, and this doesn't affect any particle two state. So what is this? They actually do commute. So we can kind of dispense with this silly thing and just to have two here, like the way we normally do. But before you do that, whenever you are dealing with the operators, you kind of want to make sure that they do commute before you do that. So now what we need to deal with is, um, I think what we have here is already enough to show that the state I have here is not an eigenstate. So this is going to be a kind of a, a kind of a hybrid uh, thing. So um, let me organize my work this way. Uh, and if uh, anything's not clear, raise your hand and let me know. So uh, I'm going to I, so I'm going to do a version of this, except I'm not going to do four by four matrix because apparently when you do that, then you are messing up something so it doesn't work. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to do the calculation in parallel. So anything that relates to particle one, I'm going to keep them up here. Anything that relates to particle two, I'm going to keep them down here. So I'm just going to run the calculation in parallel. Um, so this is what I want to calculate and see if it's true. So if I have this state, um, so I'm going to divide them soon. But if I have this state, psi 1, uh, not 1, psi spin up 1, product space width, psi spin down 2, is it true that if I act on this with j squared operator, do I get 0? Let's uh, try out the calculation and see. So, um, so what this is, let me just write out the, uh, let me write out the portion so that I minimize the amount of calculation I have to do. Um, so this is, let me call this operator Q. So I'm going to deal with this on its own separately. <laughs> so. What this is, it's a S1 squared plus S2 squared plus 2Q uh, acting on this state. I'm running out of space. Acting on this state. Um, psi spin up 1, psi spin down 2. And these two operators are kind of simple to deal with because it's dealing with only one of the two particles, doesn't affect the other. So I can kind of get the result with these first two. Um, these first two, they're just going to give me, uh, they're going to lead to, well, um, h bar, or, or rather, 3 h bar squared over 4 plus 3 h bar squared over 4 um, acting on the state. That's what I end up with. So what I have to handle is this Q. And that's where I want to divide up my space. Um, let me um, use the idea about except I will yeah, waste still lot of space. Uh, let me divide up the space this way. And above here, I'll carry out the calculation that involve, um, involve state one. And down here, I will carry out the calculation that Involve state two. Can I even do it that way? <laughs> Let me try to do it in a way that's not super confusing. Um, sorry, that doesn't work either. <laughs> um, uh, let me do one sample calculation. I think that's better. Uh, the, so you know, Q is a sum of three terms. So let me just do this. Um, let me do this one as a sample calculation. I think that's going to be a lot better. So 
uh, this is what it's going to look like. Um, let's see, where do I have enough space? Um, I think I have enough space here. Um, so that operator acting on this, S1x, S2x acting on this state, It looks a lot cleaner if I attach the operator to the states they are actually able to act on. So I'm going to write it out this way. S1 acting on this, acting on psi spin up one, product space width, this operator acting on this. S2x psi spin down two. All right, and the rest I carry out the calculation with the matrices because um, the spin up state is not an eigenstate of this. So when you write it out, it looks complicated. It's easier to do it in the matrix form. So imagine multiplying with this on the spin up state, then you end up with, um, I guess, just h bar over 2, 0, 1, right? So this times that is 0. This times that is 1. So for this first state here, you end up with um, this, h bar over 2, um, 0, 1, product space. So this is for particle 1. <laughs> I have to keep the label so that I remember what particle it uh, goes with. For this one, it will be uh, spin down state, with this, oh, it's one zero. So it's, uh, hey, did it just flip around? H bar over two, one zero. Okay. So, um, all right. So my state has changed. So this state is definitely not the same as, uh, so, so I guess if, uh, if I collect it back out, what this is is, this is, you know, it, it, this scalar moves through, so I have h bar squared over 4 multiplied to this state. Spin down 1, so spin down 1, and spin up 2, spin up 2. And this state is not the same state as this, which means um, it's not an eigenstate. And um, so actually, let's just all write it out. Um, I guess, yeah, so we've already started here with these two. Um, let's just uh, kind of just keep writing out what this 2q is. We just did it here. So it's a plus 2 times. Um, we worked this out. So it's. A, h bar squared over 4, not even the same state, psi down 1, psi up 2. Um, and if we do it for y and z, at least I think with z, we are going to get the same state, right? Yes? So, um, so let's uh, see if we can talk this through. Um, or actually, you know, rather than talking through, let's uh, just use this space to do all the calculation that requires matrices. So when we are dealing with now the y component, it's S1, y, um, same state, y, y. So all right, let's imagine acting with this on this. So I get, oh, minus i, and then 0, right? So I get, um, so this becomes minus i, 0. Um, and this becomes, so acting with this on, wait, wait, did I do it? I did it back, sorry, so this should have acted on this, which would give me i. So not minus i, but i. Yeah? And when I act with this on this, I get, uh, now I get minus i. Um, Oh, sorry, um, 
Let me do this carefully. I made the keep making the same as this multiplying to this. So this times this is zero for the first row. This multiplying to this is i for the second row. So it's supposed to be zero i. And for the second particle, let's do this carefully. This multiplying to this gives me minus i for the first row. And this multiplying to this gives me zero for the second row. So minus i, zero. So, all right, um, so I guess uh, I can factor out on i. Can I factor out on i? Um, well, I can't quite, how do I put it? Um, I should factor out on i. So when I <laughs> write it out, let's see what it is. Um, uh, I, I guess I can do the calculation here. So when you factor out on i, you have, um, well, the whole thing multiplying to i. So it's a 0, 1. That's fine. That's a spin down again. And then you have um, my, no, I think the proper way to do it is this. I imagine factoring out i here. So this is 1 times i. I factor out minus i here. So this is 1 times minus i. Good. Now I can simply multiply these two. i times minus i, I get 1. So, oh, so it's just h1 over 2. Spin down, spin up. Good. Oh, so I get, I guess, another one of this. So I get two of this. Uh, let me, since <laughs> this is a very unfamiliar calculation, let's just do it for z to make sure that we are not making any unexpected mistakes. Um, so this is, the, by the way, the thing to become uh, kind of watch out for in quantum mechanics, that the calculations you are doing are very different from other calculations you do. So it becomes even more important that you know the rules and you're applying the rules very carefully. So S1, z, z applying to that, g, g, applying to that. So I get h bar over 2 for spin up, and I still end up with the same spin up, right? g, com g doesn't change anything. Is that the phone in my office ringing? They ought to know I'm teaching, so yeah, all right. Um, all right, so here it's spin down. So instead of h bar over 2, it should be minus h bar over 2. All right, so, and it should remain spin down, so 0, 1. Let me get rid of these i's. All right, so now you end up with um, spin, spin down and, uh, not spin down, you, you skip spin up and spin down as, was, as it was before, right? And in, instead of h, you have minus h bar squared over 4. Okay, uh, so that's a difference, so let me write that out. Plus, no, minus h bar squared over 4 psi. Um, and this is a distinct state from that other state. Otherwise, we could have tried to combine them, but these two states are different. Okay. So I have that. Um, do they look like they will add it to 0? I mean, OK, so this can cancel some of this, right? So I have factor six quarters. They can go down to four quarters. But um, after that, we are kind of done. We kind of uh, wish somehow this came out in a way that cancels this, but it doesn't. So um, this is a very long-winded way of covering. Um, this is why I need to have worked this through. That this is not an um, eigenstate of this operator. Uh, when we just uh, try to combine spin up and spin down um, into a single product state like this, then um, it doesn't give you a total angular momentum eigenstate. It gives you, um, when you try to measure the total angular momentum, you don't even get the same state back because the state back, that state that you get back 
It's a combination of this, which is what you started out with, mixed in with some of this, which is not what you started out with. So, um, so that's the challenge here. How do you uh, combine two spin states in such a way that it is an actual eigenstate of this operator? And if you've been following this carefully, there is a kind of a hopeful solution that you have seen uh, actually on Tuesday. Do you guys remember exchange symmetry on Tuesday? Exchange symmetry, I guess we covered it towards the end. A multiple part, multi particle state, where you, in the wave mechanics, you describe the total multi particle state with the product of uh, particle state one, particle state two, and how you know, these are indistinguishable particles. So when you swap the particle positions, you should have the same function, but you don't. And what was the solution to that? How do you build a state that is um, exchange symmetric? Like so, you know, if you have, yeah. So if you have, yeah, if you have psi one, let's say x one, and psi two, x two, the way we built a symmetric state was by okay. So you have the product, and let's add it to another product with this two swapped, pre-swapped. Um, so the pro, the, the the so the even state that we built even, it looks like this. Psi 1, x1, psi 2, x2, multiply, just regular algebra multiplication, plus psi 1, x2, times psi 2, x1. So that with a particle exchange symmetry, uh, or particle exchange operation, when you swap these two, then this swapped becomes, well, that. And this swap becomes this, so you get the same state back. The reason I am bringing it up here is because of what this reminds me. All that this state is, it's uh, this state, except you swapped which particle is spin up and which particle is spin down. So maybe we pre counter that. So instead of building our state like this, maybe we build it this way. We build it so that um, so that we are dealing with this. Um, psi one. Um, it's, it's not psi one. Psi spin up one. Psi spin down two. And as we are acting on acting with this operator, we think those two particle states are going to be swapped. So let's add the swapped version, pre-add to it. Psi spin down one, psi spin up two. So this is our proposed um, total uh, wave function state. Then, um, so let me, uh, okay, so I've been talking nonstop for a while. Um, let me give this to you exercise. Um, try working out this calculation and see what you get. You will get an eigenvalue, or um, you will be able to find that this is an eigenvector, but the eigenvalue will be a little bit different from what you might be expecting because uh, I know there's a mistake here. Um, so let me leave you to that calculation. Um, so, so let me write out, um, so let me clean this up here, and then let me write up the question that you are supposed to an be answering. So this operator, when you expand it all out, it's S1 squared plus S2 squared plus two. Sx1, Sx2 plus S y1, s y2 plus s t1, s t2. Okay, so that's the operator. And this is the question I'm asking you to answer. 
And I think you have seen enough now to actually do this calculation. Um, or you know, if you have any questions, you can call me and I'll come by and help you with it. So the question is, what is the eigenvalue of um, psi of 1, or let me call that psi. That's, this is my psi, of psi uh, with operator j squared. So um, it'll take some time because th there's a lot of math to go through. Um, so I'll, let me give you however many, much time, 10, 15 minutes. I'll be walking around, answer questions. And um, yeah, and I happen to know the correct answer without doing the calculation, so I can check your answer when you find it. Um, for those of you who are feeling like you might be stuck, let me highlight the key step um, this is the key step that involves math that you are not familiar with. This is the key step. That when you are acting with an operator that involves both particles, you want to group the operator with the correct particle. Group the operator with the correct particle. Once you have done that, you know, so that it, this is all space one, this is all space two, then you can get through the rest of the calculations. So I see a lot of people staring at the board. Um, I used to have a professor who said um, his hand can do the algebra much better than his head can. And what he meant was that if you are staring at it and trying to do it in your head, you won't be able to do it. This is too complicated. But when you work through it component by component, things will eventually simplify. So uh, if you're staring, I would uh, um, recommend that you start out with something like this, expand this out to this, which is this, acting on these two. So actually, you've seen me do it for one of them already. So you are really doing it for the second portion. So you have this result for the first portion already. Add it to the result of the second portion. And then collect like terms. These are your two terms. Collect like terms, simplify the coefficients, and you will kind of see something emerging out of that when you write it all out. So I guess I'm for those people who are staring at the board, that's what I'm telling you is uh, stop staring and start writing. <laughs> It'll get them a lot more quickly that way. Maybe either make your work easier or verify something you already know. So call this expression A. And let me write down the simplified version of A here. Let me pass out something called the classic Gordon coefficient. Um, that's what we are going to wrap up today with. Um, once you are done with the calculation and we answer our next question, I have something to show to you that's on this table. Um, but I will you know, point out what you're supposed to be doing with it when we get to that point. OK, good. OK, that's <laughs> long enough. So uh, let me write down the, so what I was telling you is you already have all of this two terms, you already have the one that corresponds to this. You only need the one for this. So this uh, could be the calculation you are doing. And if you did that, for the second part, this is what you should have ended up with. Um, H bar, I guess if you are keeping it in the same order, then it would be psi down one, psi up two, plus H bar squared. Um, Psi, um, psi um, up one, 
upside down too. But these are kind of just these two match. So, so that's how you end up with the eigenstate. And when you add them, so all right, add them together. So after adding them through, what you should end up with is 2 h bar squared and the original state that you started out with. So your final answer is um, surprisingly simple. It's a 2 h bar squared. That's your eigenvalue. Now the step getting to that, it's a long calculation. I don't want to uh, minimize that. It is a long calculation. And I won't say this is true of every calculation, but um, this is something you would see like a, um, component by component to proof, or some, there are some types of calculations where uh, it's, not, it's not so complicated as long. As in each individual step, you know how to do. If you have the final result, you know how to simplify. It doesn't take any sophisticated techniques. Just have to chalk through it. That's really the only advice I have. Have enough time, just chalk through the calculation. I will never give you on an exam something that looks like that. Um, but that's an ideal homework question where you just do an hour of algebra and you get a very simple result to which you can assign a meaning. So it's h bar squared times two. That this is supposed to my L angular momentum squared. Let's uh, refer back here. So L squared, h bar squared times, L times L plus one. If my value of L was one, then that would match with this two, right? So the state that I got, this state here, this is consistent with, I guess, let me make up a quantum number, quantum number value of one, not zero. So you added the two, one spin up, one spin down, and you en ended up with a total spin of one. Now, what this state is, it has a projection of zero along the z-axis. So it's a spin one that points in some orthogonal direction uh, that's not z-axis. <laughs> um, so what would you change it um, for those of you who finished the calculation? I, and this is where you would actually gain some insight from having done the calculation. Um, what would you change so that you end up with, instead of j equals one, you actually end up with, uh, let me do it in different color. So in order to end up with j equals zero, what change would you make to this state so that you get total angular momentum equal to zero? Yeah, instead of plus, it's a very simple change. You would change this to minus to get total angular momentum of zero. So this is the simplest possible, non-trivial um, angular momentum addition calculation. And what I passed out while you're doing the, that calculation is called the Clapsch Gordon table. Uh, while you stare at that for a little while, let me bring the projector back so that I can um, show you how to read the Clapsch Gordon table. So you could have actually read your result off of the Clapsch Gordon table instead of actually doing the calculation. Uh, So what this is, is this long calculation you just went through. It, it is a long calculation. Um, if you had to do it every time you needed the result, it would uh, take you forever to do anything useful. So somebody has done this calculation all for you already. Let me just uh, bring up the table. Um, uh, so the table actually has way more than you need. Let me zoom into the portion that I want. So. Um, so I'm looking at the smallest table there, one half by one half. That's indicating you are adding spin one half system to another spin one half system. Good. And it's uh, telling you, um, so what's uh, down horizontally is different ways of, wait, is that? Yeah, yeah, it, it's a different, uh, let me <laughs> stay in. With, um, yeah, it's a different ways of combining them. And what uh, on the vertical, along the column is how, um, is, is the end result, the total angular momentum value. So, 
is that right? Um, yeah, um, um, yeah, so uh, let me, um, well, um, let me give you the one, so, <laughs> um, let me give you some labels so that you know what the numbers stand for. So these numbers here, these stand for the quantum number J, stands for this uh, total angular magnitude of total angular momentum. Good. And these numbers here stand for, they stand for the projection of that angular momentum along z axis or a chosen axis, it's usually z axis. Yeah? So let's uh, start with the, deal with the simple ones first. If you want total angular momentum one pointing along you know, g axis, then you would add them, add the two particles as a spin up, spin up, right? So that's what this is showing. This is the coefficient for spin up, coefficient for spin up, and you are really multiplying them together, the, the direct product that we have been talking about. Then, and it comes as with a coefficient to one. And if you, yeah, and, uh, <laughs> and if you want you to get this, then it's a spin down, just, you know, the same thing. So it's uh, this thing, direct product with this thing that gives you, you know, minus one. Now, to get the projection of zero, you can end up with two different ways to get projection of zero. You can have zero total angular momentum, then projection will just, like zero is the only option left. Or you can have a total angular momentum of one, but just oriented in a different direction so that your projection is zero. So in order to get this, this is how, wow, these are really running into each other. Um, so, okay, uh, let me add the notation so that you can kind of read it. So, this is the wave, uh, uh, the, 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 the vector state. Uh, this is the spin state that um, is represented here. So, it is so to be, let me call this A, call this B. So this would be A, and this would be B, good? And what here is telling them, they're telling you, is add these two states with a minus sign in front of them to end up with a total angular momentum zero. Add the states with the same sign to end up with a total angular momentum one. And the thing about the coefficient, so when they say one half, they really mean one, you know, square rooted. <laughs> square rooted, um, so that it ends up being a normalized state. So with a spin one half system, like you knew nothing coming into this, and you were able to do this calculation, figure out the state you are given was either this or this. So spin one half, you know, as I said, simplest non-trivial system, you can do it coming into like this period knowing nothing about this. Now, as you start to add more, if you're, or if you're adding spin one to spin one half, you're adding spin two third, you know, three halves to spin one, then it gets a lot more complicated. That's what the rest of the table is for. Like what I have there is this very small portion of this table. The rest of the table is for more complicated addition of angular momentum. And um, so once again, I think I started the day with this. Whatever we cover today, um, we are not being tested on. This is supposed to be fun exercise, something that's beyond what we are supposed to cover in Physics 4C. Um, we don't need to know any of this <laughs> for the exams. I'm not gonna touch on it. But I just want you to give you a glimpse of if you are taking upper division, I don't think it actually covered this in upper division quantum. If you're able to go more into quantum mechanics, what some of the quantum mechanical calculations involve. And I would just tell you that angular momentum is one of the most quintessentially quantum mechanical thing because um, there's really nothing that's classically anything like a quantum mechanical angular momentum. That's why there's a whole table built to just to accommodate that. 
And this becomes a model for other symmetries of nature, something called the isospin that comes up in particle physics. The symmetry is modeled after symmetry of angular momentum, but isospin has nothing to do with the spin. There's a like color, Ooh, anyways. <laughs> so um, this does go into more abstract math than we are supposed to in this class. Uh, I thought I had one more thing to go over. Um, no, I think that's it. Um, so you guys answered the seven questions, and I guess you could consider this question eight, except I didn't <laughs> give you any time to write it down. Um, so that's it. Uh, that's a, that should be your lab report um, for lecture slash lab hybrid. I think this is a good time to end. So um, turn it in, please, and uh, thank you for <laughs> suffering through today. I wish it was better prepared. Um, it will be next year. <laughs> yeah.